Good evening, shalom. Welcome to this episode here of The Watchdog. I am your host, CJ Cox, coming at you a day later than the day that we are supposed to be posting these because I am your perpetually late YouTube news host. Cha-ching. Yeah, I know you enjoy that by now. Just kidding. Anyways, um, welcome to this episode here today. We've got a lot to be talking about, so I'm honestly going to have to be rushing through a lot of it. Uh, before we get into any articles, there are some things I want to talk about because they have been just on the mind recently, um, as you guys have probably already um, deduced by my recent videos. And by that I mean the anti-Zionist crusaders. So as you guys know, I have been making videos refuting some of the nonsense that is shown by Adam Green, his No More News channel. Um, I was talking about how Chuck Baldwin was um, blocking people for just asking him simple questions, which he did not ever actually end up answering. <clears throat> And, you know, and so on and so forth with other stuff. Um, and so I recently had another brief Twitter interaction with Adam Green at No More News yet again. And the reason I did is because I was bringing to his attention the fact that E. Michael Jones, somebody who he has on his channel frequently, somebody who he is allied with, right, is outright lying to people about what is going on and what actually transpired between him and Dr. Michael Brown over on the line of fire. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Michael Brown interviewed E. Michael Jones on the line of fire, right? Uh, Dr. Michael, jo Michael Brown is a Masonic Jew and Christian apologist, um, minister and missionary and things like that, right? And he is a radio host with this radio show, The Line of Fire, uh, at the Ask Dr. Brown YouTube channel, and I'm sure it's uh, syndicated on some radio shows as well, or on some radio uh, stations as well. Um, and... He actually invited the Catholic scholar E. Michael Jones to uh, have a discussion with him on the line of fire, on the line of fire, right? In order to talk about some of uh, Dr. Jones's anti, or I don't know if he's a doctor or not, but we'll just call him Dr. Jones for now. Um, some of his anti-Zionist rhetoric, right? I think he is a doctorate actually. Anyways, um, the conversation was cordial. The conversation w w revealed pretty much exactly what I think everybody was expecting. Uh, which is that E. Michael Jones believes that the Jews are basically sort of spiritually inclined to rebellion. Um, that's not something he's ever been shy about. And of course, that Dr. Michael Brown felt that it was anti-Semitic. And they're, you know, they ended up sharing obviously different um, details as far as like evidence is concerned and biblical evidences and things like that, right? And the things of uh, the words of different scholars. Um, and then the conversation, of course, ended. Um, so. E. Michael Jones comes out, starts talking with, I think Owen Benjamin was the person, if I'm not mistaken. Owen Benjamin, of course, is the comedian who used to be on Steven Crowder's program. And uh, basically, he was talking about um, how, you know, uh, excuse me, kind of losing my train of thought as far as the name here. Dr. Brown, sorry watch this guy every day you would think I would be able to remember names more commonly but anyways I uh, basically saying that Dr. Brown was going around calling him anti-semitic when he never did so before calling him Christian anti-semite when he never did so to his face and also saying that Dr. Brown actually said people should be arrested for having anti-zionist rhetoric these are the words of E. Michael Jones these were his claims right just outright falsehoods um, I brought this video to the attention of Adam Green. I'm trying to find the exact, uh, matter of fact, it might even be best to just go on to Twitter, possibly. Let me see that here, just one moment. Um, I basically brought this video to his attention in order to basically revealed to him that his allies are being dishonest, that they are not actually representing correctly the positions of people who they are actually uh, going against. It, I actually took these screenshots out of order, so I'm just going to actually go to Twitter. My apologies here. But the response was very telling, let me tell you, because as it turns out, um, he doesn't really care, right? And he ended up just saying more dishonest things and kind of you know throwing himself in the same boat with E. Michael Jones on that matter. Um, let's see, you gotta make sure I'm getting the right one. All right, here we are. Go up on this thread. All 
So I said, and I sent this to Chuck Baldwin as well. He, of course, did not answer. How does it make you feel that everyone in your movement has to resort to out, outright lies and cowardly running? Right? Uh, what I'm referring to, of course, is with the E. Michael Jones lies, lies there. Uh, if you see here, we have the link where Dr. Michael Brown actually goes to it. Um, let me just switch apps. No. Tweet is unavailable. Okay, so I guess the tweet was deleted anyways. Uh, but nonetheless, right, you, you see what I was telling you there. So here we have YouTube, right, sharing a video and then sharing another video here, which is Chabad and Noah Hyde Laws Exposed. No real response to it. People can catch my work and decide who's lying for themselves is the best that we get. In this case, it's just the video. So I say... It's funny, I ask you about your allies, people you have on your program, and pass off as reliable sources of info. Your response to their obvious and blatant lies is to, complete, is to post completely irrelevant videos. Very telling, you're anti-Zionist, or you anti-Zionist, rather, get more exposed by each and every breath. And he says, your ally Brown is the dishonest one. So I ask him where. It uh, doesn't look like it actually goes all the way down. Twitter has a very weird way of showing how these uh, how these end up, you know, transpiring. But nonetheless, I think I do still have that in the um oh right, right here actually. See, there's more proof of Santa Claus than Noah Hyde laws is what he says. Brown, a blatant lie. So. To recap now, <clears throat> because my digging through Twitter here in this clumsy fashion has actually kind of lost context in my opinion, so I'll recap real quick. What he is claiming is that Dr. Michael Brown is dishonest because he says there is more proof of Santa Claus than Noahide laws, right? Which is what you have here. He doesn't actually show a link to that, he rather just shows a link to his own video again, but nonetheless we'll actually get to that in a second. Notice though... He does not actually respond to the blatant lies of people who are on his side. Dr. Michael Brown said straight to uh, E. Michael Jones' face that he was anti-Semitic. Dr. Michael Brown said straight to Michael Jones' face that um, he believed that this was a, you know, a, a kind of a, a cover for what he believed to be a anti-Semitism, that basically saying that somebody has a spiritual inclination to something is no different than saying they have a racial inclination to something. And he never once claimed anything that would even that could even possibly be understood by anybody of any high Q higher than 12 to mean we should go arrest people who are not actually, or who are criticizing uh, Zionism. That was never said. That's an outright lie. He never called for violence against people like E. Michael Jones. That's an outright lie. Okay? And this is what Michael Jones decides to say. He then deletes the tweet after he's called out on it because, fun fact, these anti-Zionists are not actually used to being called out on their nonsense. People usually just ignore them. He completely ignores that. This person who he's had on this program, this person who he passes off as an authority on these matters. And by the way, it's not just like... Oh, they're allies, because obviously you shouldn't be responsible for all the things that your allies say, okay? But it's the fact that a good portion of what Adam Green says is directly parroted from either Stephen Benoon or E. Michael Jones. I wouldn't say all of it, most definitely, but a huge portion of what he says is literally just copy and pasted what they say, right? And yet we can reveal them to be incredibly dishonest people. So there's no more proof of or there's more proof of Santa Claus than Noah Hyde laws, which is what he says. So I say he said there was more chance uh, he said there was more of a chance that a woman who called uh, in would meet Santa Claus than be subjugated to Noah Hyde laws. That's actually not entirely true too. I actually so once I went back on it, um, I did end up kind of misquoting that a little bit. But nonetheless, I do actually have it for you right here. So is this one the truth about Noah Hyde laws? One it is. So. Listen to this real quick, right, and you'll see what Dr. Michael Brown actually said, because now it's not only one uh, group of people in E. Michael Jones and Dr. Uh, Chuck Baldwin who are running away from people, who are banning people, right, but actually, or who are being dishonest about people as well, sorry, but actually, Adam Green is as well, so. supporter of the Noahide laws, I'm a supporter of the gospel of Jesus, but 
Let's take a look at this. Let's go back to a call from last Friday's broadcast, and here's what happened. Let's go to Karen in Florida. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I have a question on the seven Noahide laws. Um, and there's a, a couple on YouTube, I think they're a messianic couple, who are uh, talking about the dangers of the Noahide laws and that uh, President Trump has. Sorry, I paused that. Endorsed uh, the Noahide laws. And if you read closely, it could mean that Christians could possibly be beheaded. Yeah. And um, there, there are actual several sites right now that are really um, talking about this. So I, I really wanted to know what you, what yeah. your opinion on all this. All right. So I answered by saying there's more truth to the idea that Santa Claus delivered presents to every child in America and that Elvis Presley and Michael Jackson are teaming up to do a concert and that Christians are going to be beheaded under this. I'm looking at our YouTube chat, and according to one gentleman, the guillotines are, guillotines are already set. This is really going to happen. All right, now, first thing, uh, I, I began, as soon as this broadcast was posted right. on YouTube. So, what you did not say, there's more proof of Santa Claus than there is of Noahide laws, which is this very ridiculous statement that would almost imply that Noahide laws don't exist, right? It actually right, does imply Noahide laws don't exist. So what Adam Green is saying is that Michael Brown says Noahide laws don't exist. What does he actually say? That there's more truth to the idea that Santa Claus delivers presents than there is to the idea that Christians are going to be beheaded under Noahide laws. It's a very specific claim. Right, something that, and the whole Christians being beheaded under no high laws, as you saw for yourself, was not even brought up at all in the context of what um, Adam Green was saying. But here we go, actually, back to the Friday video, because maybe that shysty Jew, Michael Brown, is pulling his shysty Jewry, right? And maybe, as it turns out, he actually is lying about what he said before because he's nefarious and Jewish and other sorts of, you know, things that obviously mean deceitful, right? So let's find out. Three for truth. Let's go to Karen in Florida. Welcome to the line of fire. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I have a question on the seven Noahide laws. Um, and there's a, a couple on YouTube, I think they're a messianic couple, who are uh, talking about the dangers of the Noahide laws and that uh, President Trump has endorsed uh, the Noahide laws and if Closely, it could mean that Christians could possibly be beheaded. Yeah. And um, there, there are actual several sites right now that are really um, talking about this. So I, I really wanted to know what you, what yeah. your opinion on all this. Is. You know, when, when I was when I was a young guy, I had a really thick head of hair. I still got a decent amount of hair, but you know, it, it's thin. If my hair wasn't important, I'd be pulling it all out <laughs> over this <laughs> over this question here. Okay, uh, I have recently this is like the big thing now that's out there. There's seven Noahide laws, and if they're enforced, Christians could be beheaded. Right. Okay, there is more truth. Right. There is more truth to the idea that Santa Claus personally delivered presents to every child in America last Christmas. There is more truth to that, or that Elvis Presley is alive and well and producing a new album along with Michael Jackson, okay? There's more truth to that than this myth, which is complete and utter nonsense. So where in the world are people getting this idea from? I, I will explain on the other side of the break, but I am so glad that you asked the question. Those, those who are watching, you saw. Right? So, as it turns out, no nefariousness, no shystiness, no shilling, right? Adam Green is just lying about what Dr. Excuse me, what Dr. Michael Brown actually said. Just like E. Michael Jones is. Just like Owen Benjamin is. Why do they have to resort to dishonesty about the topic... In order to, and by the way, this isn't some kind of ad hominem where it's like, oh, this person is dishonest, so you shouldn't trust them. No, they're being dishonest about the specific topic we're actually addressing, namely the anti-Zionist conspiracy theory, right? 
And they're saying Dr. Michael Brown wants Christians to be beheaded. Dr. Michael Brown is shilling for Israel. Dr. Michael Brown is saying Noahide laws don't even exist. And Michael Jones is saying that Michael Brown actually thinks that people who are criticizing anti-Zionism, the violence should be done against them and that, you know, that they should be arrested and things like that. And it's lies. It's all lies. And why is it that they have to lie about this person with a bunch of ad hominem attacks, right? Because those are actually ad hominem attacks, especially considering the fact that none of them are true. Because he's out there refuting them and he's got a big platform and they don't like it because he's right, right? And in the end, almost all anti-Zionism boils down to anti-Semitism, okay? There is certainly legitimate anti-Zionism, right? In fact, there's even a good deal of Orthodox Jews. In fact, most Orthodox Jews are anti-Zionist, which is one of the big collapsing points, actually, of the anti-Zionist conspiracy theory. They always say, well, the Orthodox Jews have all these Talmudic laws and stuff like that. Yeah, but the Orthodox Jews don't actually believe in Zionism. So there's a really big flaw in your, uh, in your plan here or in your ideas. But nonetheless... I'm um, going to continue on here. I'm looking up actually where, because they, it goes to a break, and we're going to skip the break and just go to everything else that was said. But nonetheless, it says a few more right things here. When the question was being asked. All right, so what are the seven Ohad laws? And is there a chance that if these are enforced, that Christians will be beheaded? We'll answer that when we come back. See, now he's clearly being facetious anyway, about it. Okay, or not facetious. Yeah, me. no, that's the right word. Yeah. Facetious about it. Thank you. Um, but... He is not saying what people are saying he is saying. Let's go ahead and skip these ads here. Ow! One second. That's not what I wanted. My apologies, friend. That's not what I wanted either. Yeah. Anyways. Uh, let's go to 4556, where he starts talking about it again. I'm used to using my phone where I just double tap it, so that's what I was doing, so my apologies on that. 4551, close enough. 6634, truth. Okay, back to Karen in Florida. First, what are the seven laws of Noah? These are seven laws deduced by rabbinic tradition from Genesis, the ninth chapter. I say deduced by rabbinic tradition because you don't find them all explicitly there, but these are... Okay, real quick, right? This is another thing I need to point out because Adam Green and all these others have been lying about this again, right? This is another lie being told. They're saying that Dr. Michael Brown thinks that the seven Noahide laws originate in Genesis 9. Notice that's not what he said. He said they are deduced from Genesis 9 as in from a commentary, which is what the Talmud is. In other words, he's accurately describing how we got the Noahide laws. Rabbis looked and with their own personal commentary deduced seven Noahide laws from uh, Genesis 9. He's not saying they're in Genesis 9. In fact, the seven Noahide laws, I think we would all agree, do not come from the scriptures. He's actually saying that now when he's saying they are deduced from by rabbis in the Talmud, right? But nonetheless. Laws against, uh, against idolatry, against cursing God, against murder, against adultery and sexual immorality, against theft, against uh, eating flesh torn from a living animal, and the mandate to establish courts of justice. Okay. Were these enforced by Jews on the world. No, that was never the purpose. The purpose was to say this, that Judaism has the Torah, Judaism has the 613 commandments, has expanded rabbinic tradition into thousands of subdivisions. That's what Jews are called to live by. But Gentiles are not called to live by it. So how does a Gentile live a righteous life? Well, according to a traditional Jew, by keeping these laws. They don't need to follow the Torah, they don't need to follow the dietary laws, they don't need to follow these other things. But if they do those things, that they'll be considered righteous in God's sight, and according to Judaism, the righteous of all nations have a place in the world to come. And some of those laws are reflected in Acts the 15th chapter when the apostles agree not to put the entire law of Moses on Gentile believers, but to give them some basic... Now briefly, I'd like to actually disagree with Michael Brown on this particular point. Um, just in the way that he worded it, I would say that 
it's the other way around. Um, the, the Noahide laws probably reflect Acts 15, not that Acts 15 reflects the Noahide laws, right? Um, in other words, that Acts 15 came first, right? And that the Noahide laws were deduced afterwards. I would also say that there's no real correlation between the two in the sense of that clearly one is done by one body of scholars and another is done by people who I believe were actually inspired by the Holy Spirit to say what they said, right? Um, and I, I believe he would say that as well. But when he, when you say um, it's reflected in Acts 15, it sounds to me like you're saying that it's actually something that they like that the people writing Acts 15 or the people who are being described in Acts 15 were um, that it's something that they would like take as an influence. I don't think that's what Dr. Michael Brown means. If anybody who's out there is like, oh, we caught him, the, we there we go, we have him right there. Well, then go ahead and ask him the question, right? And if he answers the way that I think he would answer, then whatever. But nonetheless, I want to make a brief correction there. Guidelines to start with, those come from this same uh, material. So that's all it is. You say, well, where are people getting this idea from? There is a passage in the Law Code of Moses by Maimonides. Maimonides lived from 1135 to 1204, where he talks about enforcing the Noahide laws and that there's capital punishment for those who refuse to obey them. You say, where does that tie in with Christians? Well, someone would claim Although Judaism does not claim this, someone would claim that if Christians are worshiping the Trinity or Jesus as God, then that's idolatry, and under the Noahide laws, you're put to death for idolatry. Okay, so first, Judaism does not believe it is idolatry for Christians to worship God as Trinity. They call it shituf. It, it is kind of a, a cooperation of different beings, but they do not believe that it is idolatry for a Gentile. They would say it's wrong for a Jew, but it's not idolatry for a Gentile. So Judaism has no problem saying that they're okay. righteous Christians. So, or righteous at Muslims best, because they're if that right is accurate, which of course I'm sure somebody's going to try and make a claim that it's not accurate, um, we'll get more into that hopefully in this in a weekend's episode of Unapologetics because I feel like that's more of the uh, uh, apologetics kind of topic rather than a news one but nonetheless um the best you could get from that is actually that in israel uh messianic jews would be beheaded under this which actually believe it or not is something that i think is a, is a legitimate concern um I, I wouldn't you know i am certainly a zionist in the sense that i do believe there should be a land for the jewish people that is controlled ruled by the jewish people in israel right um I believe in self-determination for all nations, right? For all peoples. I think they should all have their own countries. That said, though, there is something, you know, there is something that bothers me a lot in that the people who seem to make the most sense politically speaking, uh, the Mayor Kahanas, the Benjamin Netanyahu's, the Menachem Begins, right? Um, even, you know, to a certain extent, the Yehuda Glicks, right? Uh, they seem to have a either very globalist bent in the in the case of Yehuda Glick in particular or a uh, well I don't know if it's a globalist in the case of Yehuda Glick it's more like he, he wants internationalization of the city of Jerusalem I don't like that at all in fact I I'm not sure if Yehuda Glick is not possibly in on the whole uh Vatican idea to, to actually split the city and control the old city. I, I, I have questioned that a lot. To the best of my knowledge, I've found no links between him and the Vatican yet, but it is something that I question quite a bit. The reason he, I think he makes sense is because I do think that it, there's an ethical problem with not allowing Jews to actually you know, pray and say hymns at the Temple Mount. Um, but nonetheless, like I said, there's a lot of concerns with him. But more common in the case of Kana, in the case of Netanyahu, in the case of you know the Likud or the Kak Party or things like that, right? Um, there does seem to be an anti-Masonic bent and an anti-Christian bent. And I, as a Christian, do not like that. I also, as somebody who just has basic, you know, respect for human life and wanting people to have religious freedom, do not like that. Um, and, and that is something that I think is a legitimate concern of people if they think that there's a possibility that Masonic Jews, Christians in the land of Israel, and uh, by the way, um, any other religious groups as well, the Druze, the Baha'i, the Muslims, right? Anybody who's willing to actually say, you know, that we recognize that this is the Jewish state, the state for the Jewish people, just like if we went to Ireland, we recognize it's the Irish state, right? 
should be given their human rights. And actually, you know, there's it's interesting that I bring up Kahana because he seems to kind of contradict himself on this matter sometimes. Um, sometimes Kahana seems to say that, you know, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. They should have all their political and human rights, which, you know, it, he includes groups that other people in the modern day don't consider to be Jews or that there's, like, struggles with, like Karaites, like... Uh, the um, Ethiopian Jews, right? Um, he never mentions Masonic Jews, but you would assume that it's the same, especially considering his opinion is in regards to humanistic and atheist Jews, right? Um, at the same time, he does seem to indicate that he doesn't want people proselytizing who are not Jewish, which would include Christians, which would assumedly include the Masonic Jews, right? Um, now, I, I don't know how exactly that would work out. You know, unfortunately, Merkhan is dead. We don't actually have the opportunity to go ask him these questions, okay? But the point is, the, you know, in saying all of that, that it is a legitimate concern to say, I fear for the safety of the political rights or possibly even the lives of Masonic Jews and Christians in Israel. That is fair, okay? That is a perfect, that is a concern I myself share. But the idea that they're going to use these Noahide laws to, to start cutting off the heads of all these different Gentiles who believe in Christianity or in some other, you know, non-Jewish interpretation of God, there's just no evidence to support that whatsoever. None at all, right? Um, there are things that are similar that there is evidence to point to. I, of course, have said hundreds of times now that people need to be watching the Vatican um, but, you know, n nonetheless, there's just, I, I just need to clear this up, right? We need to report this because there's constant dishonesty on the part of these anti-Zionists. The reason you have not actually seen me go after in any of these videos, Stephen Benoon, is because Stephen Benoon so far has not actually said anything dishonest. So it's not like you can't criticize Israel. I want to make that perfectly clear. Okay. And in fact, I do think Stephen Benoon is coming from the same point that I'm coming from when I say that there is a legitimate concern for the safety of Masonic Jews in Israel. Um, I wish that Stephen Benoon would stop allying himself with the anti-Zionists. I wish he would quit with the anti-Zionist conspiracy, considering he already knew who the actual culprits behind this were in the, in the you know, form of the Vatican and stuff like that. Um, but nonetheless, Adam Green, E. Michael Jones, Owen Benjamin, I mean, these guys, they're dishonest, they're cowardly, they run away, they misquote people purposefully, right? Um, you saw for yourself right here, that is not what Dr. Michael Brown said. He never said the Noahide laws didn't exist, okay? He never said that he supported the Noahide laws. What he said, he never said that they came from Genesis 9. What he said is that they were not going to be used to attack Christians. There was no chance. And I even said that I disagree with that a little bit in the sense that I think there might possibly be a chance in Israel, depending on, you know, what kind of radicals actually get power. But let's quote people accurately here, number one. And number two, let's, you know, if we have legitimate concerns about the treatment of certain groups in Israel, which are Jewish groups for the record, Masonic Jews are groups of Jews who are Masonic, right? Then let's say that. Let's not say, oh, the Jews are going to take over the world and subjugate all the Christians to Noahide laws because that's not accurate. Let's not say, oh, Mike, Dr. Michael Brown's post the Noahide laws and says that they don't even exist because that's not accurate. Let's not say that Dr. Michael Brown wants us to go attack people who are anti-Zionist, because that's not accurate. They're lies, okay? And this anti-Zionist nonsense needs to be called out. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, too, is during this conversation, um, there was a lot of talk by Adam Green basically saying that you know, because he, he shared this picture with me, this picture, this uh, video with me that was basically Stephen Benoon talking about the uh, harmless Noahide laws, right? He puts the, he puts harmless in quotation marks. Um, and he said, an honest Jew refuting Dr. Brown. Now, first off, let me just point out that if anybody ever said, you know, when we were talking about like Black Lives Matter, for example, right? An honest black man, as if like, that's some kind of a shocking trait. I'm pretty sure that we would say that that person is racist. Right now, does that mean that that person is automatically discredited from what they are saying? No, 
But when we start seeing a pattern of lies and attacks of Jews wherever Jews happen to be, and then we see rhetoric like that, you know, the motive starts to become a little bit more uh, clear, shall we say, right? I'm not saying that they shouldn't be allowed to speak. Obviously here refuting them, I don't think they should be ignored. But let's be perfectly clear, Dr. Uh, you know, Michael Jones and Owen Benjamin and uh, Adam Green and, you know, even Chuck Baldwin, they have all consistently eventually slipped up and revealed that eh, you just don't like Jewish people. But nonetheless, when he says, you know, this an honest Jew uh, refutes Dr. Michael Brown, I asked him a question. I was like, oh, so you mean the same Stephen Benoon who you said had a, uh, quote, stupid position. You said it indirectly, right? If you guys watched my previous video, you would know that, right? Um, and he comes back with, I wish I hadn't actually deleted the uh, Facebook there, but I don't really want to go back to it, to be honest with you. Um, he says back, I've also said that the Vatican was going to be involved. As a matter of fact, you know what? Maybe I should go back because somebody's going to say, oh, he's being dishonest. He didn't actually show blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, because you guys remember, right? I was saying, oh, so you think this position that it's the Vatican that wants to rebuild the temple, that it's the Vatican that wants to um, internationalize the city of Jerusalem, that it's the Vatican that wants Israel. You think that that idea is stupid, right? Because that's what he says. Right here, here it is. I've also said the Vatican could be involved with the Temple Mountain end times, and just because I don't agree with him on one thing doesn't mean Brown is right. To which I said, no, you didn't. In one of your Alex Jones video, you literally said, to believe such a thing would make you stupid. Are you calling yourself stupid? Right? Now, once again, you know, it, it, his point here, he says, well, just because I disagree with him on one thing doesn't mean that Dr. Michael Brown is right. Yeah, but this is the person who you're saying is, you know, providing the information for you, right? This is the person you're posting back to me saying, oh, look at this ref uh, refutation of Dr. Michael Brown. And by the way, like I said, there will be a separate refutation of that video, okay? I'm not just going to ignore Stephen Benoon in this situation, right? But when you're saying that, and then you're saying, oh, but the end conclusion that Stephen Benoon is reaching and stuff like that, I completely disagree with. And not only do I completely dis disagree with it, I think he's stupid. I think anybody who believes the things that Stephen Benoon believes are stupid, but I'm going to use Stephen Benoon as a source. That does not make any sense, unless you were using him as a source to show how stupid the position is, much like I would like using Nancy Pelosi as a source, for example, or using Adam Green for a source, for example, right? But just to show exactly what I mean here. Let's just go ahead and play what he said again. The world's ending every year, and oh my God, it's the end of the world, and they gotta run to Israel to pray, because everything's gonna get blown up. You know, there's that extreme over there, uh, not really close family or anything, but... Uh, I got a clip of him saying that very thing in a second. Not my mom or dad, I guess a lot of close family, you, you could call them Christian Zionists. So, I grew up with that giving me a headache, all the bullying over the years. It gives them a headache, but they he makes it seem like what I talk about is crazy. I, and anybody that exposes Zionism and Christian Zionism and all this end game, he says they're anti-Semitic and, and they're not allowed on the show. And, and you know, that's, uh, you know, he's just pro-Trump and pro all of that. So I don't. Okay, so a few things that need to be noted. Thing number one, it is a lie to say that people who are having these positions are not actually allowed on InfoWars. Chuck Baldwin has been on InfoWars. Excuse me. One <coughs> Excuse me. Adam Green himself has been on InfoWars to discuss this specific topic. Owen Benjamin has also been on InfoWars. People keep saying, oh, he's saying, oh, Owen Benjamin shouldn't be allowed to be on the platforms or anything like that. Not what he said. What he said is, how am I deplatformed when Owen Benjamin isn't, when Owen Benjamin says things that are clearly worse than me? He was making an example to show why he should not be deplatformed, okay? So just real quick, want to go ahead and defuse those lies. Secondly, why can't you be against both? Why can't you be against both? Why can't you say that the anti-Zionist crusade that thinks that the Jews are going to take over the world and start cutting off people's heads because of these obscure Noahide laws that have never actually been referenced by any major Jewish groups to be um, to be enforceable on the Gentiles, right? Why can't you say that that is conspiratorial nonsense whilst also saying you shouldn't make an idol out of Israel? Why not both? I personally think both is completely reasonable. 
Many Israeli politicians believed that both were completely reasonable. You just heard me reference Mayor Kahana, right? Mayor Kahana was against Christian Zionism. Said that you shouldn't be giving us a bunch of money. We can handle ourselves. Why can't you be against both? He doesn't provide a reason, of course. He just says, oh, well, so obviously, since you don't support my side, you must support the other far fringe side. You know what I mean? So just because I disagree with theocracy, I must be a communist. Just because I disagree with fascism, I must be an anarchist. Is essentially the logic being used by Adam Green here. See how it's this like double speak, essentially. All the bullying over the years, all the anti-Israel stuff, all of it is all part of a larger globalist UN so Sorosian program and the Vatican is heavily involved and they want the UN to come in and take over that holy city. Here's, here's where the disinfo comes. They, it's clearly the Jews, the Temple Institute, Netanyahu, those, those people that want to take control of Jerusalem, that want to take control of the Temple Mount and rebuild the Temple. We all know that it's the Christians and the Jews that want to see the dome gone and the Temple Mount cleared so that they can rebuild the Temple. But he makes it seem like it's the Pope and the UN and the Arabs that are going to do all this stuff. Total inversion of the truth and disinfo meant to confuse. He must think his audience is just so stupid. So there you have it. If you believe the things that Stephen Benoon believes, who apparently is a good source to refute Dr. Michael Brown, which once again... We will actually get to that, but just pointing out the blatant hypocrisy here. You're involved in disinformation, an inversion of the truth, or you're stupid. From the horse's mouth, you heard it yourself, okay? But, guess this is a perfectly fine source when it fits the agenda, right? It's completely ridiculous. And it's not like he's not allowed to use these sources, but it's like when the entire argument that Stephen Benoon is making is the exact same thing that you are now saying is a complete inversion of the truth, is disinformation, is some sort of a red herring to deflect from what's actually going on, is something you must be stupid to believe or stupid to think others would believe, then I, it, it's very hypocritical that you're going to be using that source, right? But nonetheless, we're done here. Tired of this anti-Zionist nonsense. Let's move on to some other stuff that I think is completely ridiculous. But nonetheless, we do need to talk about. Um, this is something that we can talk about very briefly. So I want to talk about it. Foxnews.com. Uh, Mariah Haas. Uh, this is obviously completely ridiculous. There's no actual reason for this to be on Fox News. But that's actually my point. That's why we're talking about it today. Demi Lovato shares empowering bikini photo. Quote, I feel confident. Right. Now, we're not going to go in and actually read the article. We're not going to show you the pictures of the uh, bikini in question. We're going to address two things that I find very problematic in here. Thing number one, Fox News, a news organization, is reporting on this. Why? Why is Fox News reporting on this? This is not news. This is completely pointless nonsense, is what this is. I don't actually care what Demi Lovato feels empowered by, or whether or not she's posting pictures of herself on Instagram. Nobody who is actually going to watch the news cares about this nonsense. This is crap. This is something that leads to uh, Americans and the, the, the dumbing down of Americans. Sorry, I was going to um, word that in a way that didn't make any sense. Leads to the dumbing down of Americans when we're being fed this garbage on a constant basis. Oh, such and such a celebrity posts a picture of herself in this ravishing bikini. Ha <laughs> ha Okay, fantastic. Who cares? Follow her on Instagram if you give a damn. When I go to Fox News, I expect news. Albeit with a slightly conservative bent. Obviously, uh, every news organization is going to have its bent towards, you know, whatever position it happens to agree with. Right? But nonetheless, I expect it to be news. This is crap it's that's i'm sorry it just is it's crap and you know you heard me the other day say that you know people have at least some sort of respect for honesty and that's why they watch fox news more because fox news comes out and admits to you it's a conservative news station rather than actually you know claiming to be uh impartial and also actually makes some sort of an effort to conversate with the other side 
Very true. That doesn't mean the Fox News is good news, though. Okay. Um, I mean, this is this is garbage. It's crap. There's no reason whatsoever for a group to be talking about this unless they are talking about the negative side effects of this, which is actually the next point I'd like to make. Um, why is it that being naked is empowering? I don't understand it. It seems to me like there's this weird dichotomy in the United States where it's like, oh, if you are going out to, you know, admire the female form in any way, whether it's something like artistic or just something that's outright degrading, like watching pornography, um, both of which I would actually disagree with, by the way, just so lest anybody get confused, then you're a, you're a dog. You're an evil misogynistic dirtbag who just obviously hates women and wants to control their bodies. You see them as sexual objects. You, you, you know, whatever. Insert some sort of insult here. But at the same time, posing in a provocative fashion in virtually no clothing whatsoever makes you feel confident and empowered. If that is not the stupidest thing you've ever heard in your life, then I'm sorry that you were subjugated to so much stupid information. That is ridiculous. It makes absolutely no sense. You're talking out of both ends of your mouth here. Either A, the objectification of women in the female form is wrong, or B, it's something that makes them, that, that is going to boost confidence, that makes them feel empowered as women and should be endorsed. You cannot have it both ways. And by the way, no disrespect to Milo or Gavin or you know, Paul Joseph Watson or some of the people who are actually on my side here on the conservative end, but actually the former is correct. Sexual objectification is a very huge problem in this country. It's a massive problem in this country. Just because the Muslims take it too far doesn't mean they don't have a point in their base, right? Why is this empowering? Why is this cool? Why does this make you feel confident? It doesn't make any sense. Because you know what it actually does in reality? It makes you objectified. It makes people look at you and think, Oh, dude, she's so hot, bro. She's like, so uber sexy, yo. I would totally top that. Right? That's what people do. And then you get other people who are, you know, girls, oh, okay, I guess in order to feel confident, I'm going to have to post pictures of myself on Instagram because Demi Lovato did it. I mean, this is not good. This is not things that our society should be endorsing. And I know everybody's going to say, oh, it's social media. Social media is ruining the youth. No, this exists as an undercurrent in society regardless of social media, regardless of the media, regardless of television, right? These people still have these same thoughts and still want to express these same things without those technologies. That's just like saying guns kill people. No, they don't. People kill people. People have intentions. Those intentions are the problem. The intentions here are the problem. Okay, it has nothing to do with, well, and of course, there is a certain amount of problem in the fact that, you know, organizations like Fox News want to just like, check this out, news. No, it isn't. But nonetheless, um, wanted to bring that up because that's just, it's just nonsense. It's stupid. It's stupid that we're talking about this. It's stupid that Demi Lovato's getting on Fox News, of all things, to talk about this. Or that they're giving her, um, you know, that they're, they're talking about this after she says it. And it's stupid that this is something that is felt by the women of this, um, of this country. It's, it's quite saddening, actually. You should feel confident and empowered by having actual merit, not by looking hot. But nonetheless... Moving on, um, Governor Kay Ivey signs bill to ban abortion in Alabama. Let me tell you what, I have been so pleased on this matter in the last month, I don't even know how to contain myself. As those of you who watch this show on a day-to-day -day basis, which I know isn't much, but um, thank you, by the way, those of you who do. Uh, as those of you who do that know... I think that abortion is disgusting. I think that supporting abortion is disgusting. Just like I think that supporting racial enslavement is disgusting and the uh, systematic extermination of a certain religious and or ethnic group to be disgusting, I also find the mass murder of children in the womb to be disgusting. And I find the eugenicist idea of, oh, we can get rid of the mentally handicapped to be disgusting. So, you know, 
sorry that I'm logically consistent, but yeah, it's it's abhorrent and horrible, and if you support it, I would seriously reconsider your moral compass if I was you. Um, Governor Kay Ivey, a woman, by the way, has recently signed into law a bill that would ban abortion in Alabama, which is fantastic. I am so in love with this bill, I don't even know where to start, right? Um, everybody's saying, oh, this is just going to you know, it's going to take away women's rights to bodily autonomy, and it's going to um, make women, you know, be, uh, become criminals for having miscarriages, and it's going to make a, you know birth control illegal and all that. All lies, all nonsense. You still have complete bodily autonomy. You just can't use said bodily autonomy to hurt another living thing, right? Specifically, a human thing. Birth control is still perfectly legal. And miscarriages are also still perfectly legal because they're not actively sought out by the, uh, I guess, patient at that point. All eyes. Nonetheless, uh, this is from Mike Kaysen. What is the website here? I forgot to mention. Alabama.com. Cool. That's a cool name. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey has signed the bill to make abortion a felony in Alabama, the governor's office announced. The law does not take effect now or immediately change the legality of abortion in Alabama. Quote, to the bill's many supporters, the legislation stands as a powerful testament to Alabamans' deep-held belief that every life is precious and that every life is a sacred gift from God, end quote, Ivey said in the press release. The Senate gave final passage to the bill on Tuesday night, sending it to Ivey's desk. The language in the bill says it will take effect in six months. But the sponsors said their intent was to trigger litigation that could lead to a challenge of abortion rights nationally. That course of events would involve federal courts blocking the law, followed by appeals aimed at reaching the U.S. Supreme Court as a challenge to the Roe v. Wade abortion rights decision of 1973. The ACLU, or American Communist Lawyers Union, of Alabama and Planned... <laughs> such a funny name, Planned Parenthood. Um, have said they would sue to block the law. Here's the Ivy, uh, here is Ivy's rather full statement. Quote, Today I signed into law the Alabama Human Life Protection Act, a bill that was approved by overwhelming majorities in both chambers of the legislature. To the bill's many supporters, the legislation stands as a powerful testament of Alabamians' deep held, deeply held belief that every single life is precious and that every life is a sacred gift from God. To all Alabamians, I assure you that we will continue to follow the rule of law. In all meaningful respects, the bill closely resembles the abortion ban that has been a part of Alabama law for well over 100 years. As today's bill itself recognizes, the longstanding abortion law has been rendered unenforceable as a result of the U.S. Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade, which, as I have said numerous times before, was a completely unconstitutional decision and the state should just tell the federal government to go to hell. I mean, go ahead and try and enforce it, right? And if this is a hill we have to die on, then so be it. No matter one's personal view on abortion, we can all recognize that, at least for the short term, the bill may be similarly unenforceable. As citizens of this great country, we must always respect the authority of the U.S. Supreme Court, even when we disagree with their decisions. That's false. We should only respect their decisions if they can give us clear constitutional reason for their decisions. They are not gods. They are men. Many Americans, myself included, disagreed when Roe v. Wade was handed down in 1973. The sponsors of this bill believe that this is, uh, that it is time, once again, for the U.S. Supreme Court to revisit this important matter, and they believe this act may bring about the best opportunity for this to occur. I want to commend the bill's sponsors, Representative Terry Collins and Senator Clyde Chambliss, for their strong leadership on this important issue. For the remainder of this session, I now urge all members of the Alabama legislature to continue seeking the best ways possible to foster a better Alabama in all regards, from education to public safety. We must give every person the best chance for a quality life and a promising future. The Republican majority in the House and Senate passed the bill over opposition from Democrats. The law makes it a felony for a doctor to perform an abortion. The woman would not be criminally liable. She should definitely be, but that's okay. The law includes an exception to allow abortions in case of serious health risks to a woman. In recent days, Ivy said she would wait to see the final version of the bill before deciding to sign it. The bill does not include an exception to allow abortions for uh, victims of rape and incest. Randall Marshall, executive producer of the ACLU of Alabama, issued this statement. Quote, by signing this bill, the governor and her colleagues in the state legislature have decided to waste millions in, in Alabama taxpayer dollars in order to defend a bill that is simply a political effort to overturn 46 years of precedent that has followed the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision. We will not allow that to happen. We will see them in court. Despite the governor signing this bill, clinics will remain open 
open, and abortion is still a safe legal medical procedure at all clinics in Alabama. Kind of funny to call anything that terminates a life safe, but whatever. Stacey Fox, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Southeast, also issued a statement. Quote, We vowed to fight this dangerous abortion ban every step of the way, and we meant what we said. We haven't lost a case in Alabama yet, and we don't plan to start now. We will see Governor Ivey in court. In the meantime, abortion is still safe, legal, and available in the state of Alabama, and we plan to keep it that way. Actually, not true. It is unsafe because it kills people, illegal because that's the bill that was just signed in, and the Supreme Court's ruling was unconstitutional to begin with, and I really, really must say, though I love this bill, I think they're taking it, th going about it the wrong way. What they should be doing is telling the United States Supreme Court, telling the United States federal government, you do not have the ability to enforce your ruling here. We're not going to let you because you do not have the constitutional authority to enforce that ruling. I am still waiting for somebody to present to me the constitutional amendment which says you have a right to have an abortion. It does not exist, okay? And the Supreme Court does not have any authority to legislate from the bench whatsoever. Therefore, their laws are actually unenforceable if we are being constitutionally consistent. And Alabama has every right to tell these clinics you cannot operate here. It's the exact same thing as saying marijuana is illegal, or legal, rather. The federal government did not have the right to actually take this right from the American public in the first place, so they don't have the right to enforce their taking of this right when a state says we're going to legalize it, okay? It's the exact same thing here, and I wish that the abortion crowd was as brave as the marijuana crowd in saying, we're just simply not going to listen to you. Because that is how you are going to fix this. Not by continuing on with this precedent of unelected judicial emperors in this country. Practical the theocrats, right? Who get to just make whatever moral activist claims that they want and legislate it into law from the bench. That is not what the Constitution intended. Nonetheless, Alabama Re Republican Party Chair Terry Lathan issued a statement praising the new law. The legislation passed by the Alabama House of Representatives and State Senate and now signed into law by Governor Kay Ivey is a positive step forward in protecting the lives of, an un of the unborn, millions of which have, ended, uh, have been ended since the U.S. Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision in 1973, Lathan said. Our legislators have worked tirelessly on this measure in hopes it will be a test case that will ultimately lead to SCOTUS reviewing the Roe decision, one which will lead the plaintiff uh, now, uh, one which the lead plaintiff now wants overturned. Alabama is a pro-life state. Whenever the issue of ending abortion is put to the, before the voters, it receives overwhelming support. Just this past November, when the Amendment 2 was on the ballot, Alabama spoke up strongly and voted to affirm the sanctity of life. End quote. Right, so he's... I, I mean, I agree with him that we need to stop this. I agree with him that this law is a fantastic law. But why not just say this is law now in Alabama and tell the federal government to go to hell? Just like Idaho does with the gun laws. Just like um, California and other states and Colorado, right, and et cetera, did with the marijuana laws. Why don't you just do that? They don't have the constitutional authority to enforce this r ruling, period. And if anybody disagrees, I'd, I'd perfectly willing for you to show me how, right? Criticism, comments, concerns, and et cetera, down in the comment section below. Basic facts of the matter is you do not have a constitutional right to kill your children, okay? And... Uh, the other reason I think that this is not necessarily the best way to go about this is, unfortunately, I don't actually have faith that the current Supreme Court would actually go against uh, Roe v. Wade, right? Both Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, as I have pointed out numerous times, are moderates on this issue. I mean, th there you are, right? So there's no reason to think that those two are going to vote in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade. That's incredibly important because without those two, you only have three who would. Right? That's, we're not very, uh, or it might be three or four nonetheless, but the point is the majority that pro-life people think they have is barely, and it's also not actually there. But even if it was there, it would be by a few Supreme Court justices. It's not like this is overwhelming by any stretch of the imagination. And so I just, I think this is the wrong way to go about it. But nonetheless, um, I commend Alabama and Georgia and these other states for standing up for the right to life. 
Um, it is one of the key fundamental rights, not only outlined in our Declaration of Independence, but the only, it is one of the rights that is required in order for the ten rights of the Constitution to actually be legitimate. Um, and it's not, for those of you who say, oh, we have separation of church and state, this is not a religious issue. Okay, If you think that whether or not you should murder children is a religious issue, well, then thank you for revealing to me the obvious moral superiority of religion over atheism. But nonetheless, we continue. Got five minutes, man. <sighs> Always want to talk about stuff, and I end up not talking about all stuff. Um... So we had the Supreme Court's Breyer mentioning abortion case warned about overturning precedent. Um, among the cases that deserve respect as precedent is the court's 1992 ruling in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which upheld the fundamental right to abortion, he wrote. Um, Supreme Court Justice uh, Stephen Breyer warned Monday that his colleagues might be too eager to overturn earlier ruling that uh, he said deserved respect as established precedent, mentioning a key abortion ruling as one of them. Um, established precedent is ridiculous, quite frankly. Either the law says something or it doesn't. The, again, the, the legislation of the courts is completely ridiculous. I advise you guys to uh, read this article for yourself. I'm going to just briefly go through a few different articles because we only have a few more minutes. Um, all of which I will actually post in the description down below and will advise you guys to read for yourselves. Trump declares national emergency over threats against U.S. technology amid campaign against uh, Huawei or Huawei, however you say that. I will actually be talking about that more tomorrow because this is a very important situation that needs to be talked about. Uh, Trump declared on Wednesday a uh, national emergency over threats against American technology. The move done via Executive Order authorized Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross in consultation with their top officials to block transactions that involve information or communication technology that pose an unacceptable risk to the national security of the United States. That is not okay. Okay, There is no reason whatsoever, I don't care what side you're on, conservative or liberal, there is no reason whatsoever that we should be blocking transactions in communications in this country, okay? Which, yes, we take a certain risk when we do that, but those who will take security over liberty deserve neither, in the great words of Benjamin Franklin. Nonetheless, um, Iran's um, our IRGC chief is ready for full confrontation with the U.S. On April 8th, the U.S. designated the IRCG a terrorist organization. Salami was appointed to head the organization on April 21st. Um... They have said that they are uh, ready for full confrontation with the enemy with uh, reference to escalating tensions against the United States, and they have made similar uh, proclamations about Israel. We'll, of course, of course, talk more about that in tomorrow's episode. Um, Bayer and Monsanto are being brought down, so we'll be able to talk more about that with their latest legal battles here from InfoWars. And last but not leastly, the UN um, leader, Gutierrez, has been meeting with this clown, this moron, right? Antonio Gutierrez uh, said Sunday that the political will to fight climate change seemed to be fading at the same time that things are getting worse. And uh, for those who are feeling the effects, meeting with the clown Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. And we will, of course, talk more about that later as well. But those will all have to wait for tomorrow because unfortunately I spent too long talking about the anti-Zionist clowns and abortion. So... Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, or concerns, you can go ahead and throw those in the comment section down below. We certainly appreciate any dialogue here and welcome all dialogue, except for those who are going to sit there and continuously spew um, either ad hominem or harassment, right? Those kinds of things will not be accepted. Uh, nonetheless, we definitely welcome actual dialogue. That includes criticisms, and it even includes rough, rough criticisms. Quite frankly, call me whatever names you want. Um... If you are interested in our content, please do like and share this video as well as subscribe to us here at the Synagogue. You can also, of course, like us at the American Cynic Party on Facebook, Cynic Thought on Instagram, CJ Cox or ACP Official on Gab, the Synagogue on Minds, or the uh, Terrestrial Earthbird account on Twitter. And we certainly appreciate all of your support there. Uh, shalom, you guys have a great rest of your evening, and we will see you when we see you.